Bienvenidos y bienvenidas a nuestro ciclo de charlas virtuales con sentido que organiza la Escuela de Terapia Ocupacional de la Universidad Austral de Chile, con motivo del Día Nacional del Terapeuta Ocupacional. Queremos darle una especial bienvenida a la profesora Claire Hawking, quien nos acompaña desde Nueva Zelanda, al director de Escuela de Terapia Ocupacional de nuestra universidad, Randy Yáñez, a estudiantes de nuestra y otras casas de estudio, a docentes y colegas. Antes de partir eh, con nuestra programación, eh, les queremos compartir algunos aspectos técnicos eh, que, que deben tener en consideración para que puedan disfrutar eh, de esta charla. Lo primero es que esta charla cuenta, esta conferencia cuenta con traducción simultánea eh, y para ello, para que ustedes puedan escuchar a la profesora Claire Hawking, en la barra de tareas abajo van a encontrar un botón que dice eh, trans, traducción y deben escoger el idioma en el que ustedes quieren escuchar. Principalmente para los que requieran traducción, deben eh, apretar seleccionar español en interpretación. Así es. ¿Sí? Si tienen alguna duda, me lo hacen saber por el chat, por favor. Además, les recuerdo que esta eh, conferencia está siendo transmitida ahora en directo a través del canal de YouTube de la Facultad de Medicina de la Universidad Austral de Chile y pueden acceder a ella a través del de, eh, hashtag Facultad Medicina UAT. La charla en este minuto va a ser transmitida en el idioma original, por lo tanto la conferencia de la profesora Claire Hawking va a ser transmitida en idioma en inglés. No obstante, la estamos grabando en español para luego eh, la vamos a publicar en el mismo canal de YouTube en español y van a acceder en ambos idiomas. Luego que la profesora Claire Hawking eh, dé su conferencia, vamos a tener un espacio eh, para una ronda de preguntas y eh, les pido por favor que eh, para la traducción enciendan sus cámaras y sus micrófonos para que el traductor pueda hacer la traducción a la profesora Claire Hawking eh, o bien lo escriban por el chat y yo eh, transmito la información, su pregunta o comentario. Vale. A continuación, el director de escuela, Randy, nos compartirá eh, un, unas palabras de bienvenida. Así que, eh, Randy, puedes activar tu micrófono, por favor. Muchas gracias. Eh, muy buenas tardes a todas y todos. Le doy la más cordial bienvenida a esta charla, a esta conferencia de cierre del ciclo eh, actividades, actividades Virtuales con Sentido. Eh, a propósito del Día Nacional de la eh, Terapeuta Ocupacional. Eh, durante este ciclo de charlas contemplamos ocho conferencias de diversos temas afines y de interés para, para nuestra disciplina. Eh, y hoy tenemos eh, la última de este primer ciclo, que espero que podamos repetir en algún momento, eh, a cargo de la profesora eh, Claire Hawking. Eh, en esta conferencia de cierre ya no, nos va a hablar respecto de, de conversaciones más allá de la brecha, investigación en ciencias de la ocupación con impacto en la inclusión social. Eh, ¿Qué mejor que ese tema para poder cerrar este ciclo de charlas que eh, eh, fue muy, muy exitoso? Eh, y para el día de hoy eh, tenemos este corolario, ¿cierto? Esta guinda de la torta y a, espero que esta eh, conferencia sea muy provechosa y muy buena para cada uno y cada una de todos nuestros participantes. Les agradezco, les doy la bienvenida nuevamente y sin más los dejo entonces con el inicio de esta conferencia. Muchas gracias. Bueno, muchas gracias. Eh, a continuación quiero presentar a nuestra invitada, a la profesora Claire Hawking. Eh, la doctora Hawking es terapeuta ocupacional y es cientista de la ocupación con una amplia trayectoria académica. A través de su carrera ha trabajado con profesionales, académicos, investigadores y estudiantes para transformar la terapia ocupacional a nivel nacional e internacional. 
ha participado en publicaciones fundamentales para el desarrollo de las ciencias de la ocupación, siendo coautora de la tercera edición del libro Occupational Perspective of Health, de Anne Wilcock, y coeditora del libro Occupational Science, Society, Inclusion and Participation. Ha sido autora de más de 30 capítulos y de 120 artículos de revistas arbitradas. Asimismo, ha supervisado 12 tesis doctorales y 38 tesis de maestría hasta su finalización. Ha sido la editora ejecutiva del Journal of Occupational Science desde 1997, y publicó junto con la profesora emérita Liz Townsend la revisión de la Declaración de Posición sobre Derechos Humanos de la Federación Mundial de Terapia Ocupacional. Hoy nos presenta la conferencia titulada Conversaciones más allá de la brecha, investigación en ciencias de la ocupación como impacto en la inclusión social. Bienvenida, Claire. Tenakoto, tenakoto, tenakoto katoa. What I've just done is to greet you in the traditional Maori um, way of greeting. So three greetings, tenakoto, tenakoto, tenakoto katoa. The first greeting is to the land. So the place where we're standing, uh, at, or the two places on which we're standing this morning. The second greeting is to the ancestors and the people who come before us. So um, really acknowledging that none of us stands alone, that none of the ideas that we have to present um, are truly only ours, that they're built on the ideas and built on the, um, the dignity of the people who came before us. The third greeting is to the people who are assembled. Uh, and I see on the count, at the bottom that there are 47 people here and, and perhaps many more on the live YouTube. So namahi nui kia koutou katoa. Warm greetings to everyone. Um, and let me just begin by sharing my screen so that you can watch my presentation and I will need to just pop our faces over to one side. Um, Can someone confirm that that's come up because it's not up on my screen? Does the shared screen come up? Yeah. <clears throat> yes, it's okay. Okay, we can see it. Good all right. Yeah. All right, so that is not quite working on my screen, so I will need to work out how to switch the slides. Okay. Uh, so the first slide here is, um, is the title of my presentation, Speaking Across the Divide, Education of Science and Forming Social Inclusion. Uh, lots of background noise, so I wonder if there's a few more people that just need to turn their microphones off, please. All right, let me just introduce myself. So you've heard an introduction um, in, in the formal academic sense, but I think it's nice to have more of a personal sense also of the people that you're speaking to. Um, I'm Caucasian, born in New Zealand. Uh, so that's a group of islands down in the South Pacific Ocean. One way to describe New Zealand is that we are a paradise of sun and sea, clean water, a temperate climate and fertile soil. I live with my dog Cleo uh, and I'm hoping that she will cooperate for the duration of the lecture and just sleep quietly on her bed. Besides working as an academic and editing the Journal of Occupational Science, I love to have visitors, uh, although international visitors don't happen at these times. Um, and I love to make things. So the picture on the top right of your screen is a rag rug that I um, knitted. Uh, it's currently in my bathroom. So that's one narrative of who I am and, and one that really embeds me in Western ways of knowing and a very rational worldview. An alternative and equally true narrative is that I'm Pākehā. I'm the daughter of English settlers who came to Aotearoa. Um, that's a Māori term, which means the land of the long white cloud that forms over the mountains that extend the length of the country. The British colonizers, my parents and ancestors, largely disparaged and displaced the rich culture of Māori people, took their land 
and discriminated against them in every sphere of life. That legacy has created deep-seated injustices, many of which centre on the things that are done, the differential value given to Māori ways of doing things and Pākehā ways, um, and the impact that human occupations have on Papatuanuku, the Earth Mother. This narrative embeds me in issues like justice and population health. Both of these worldviews inform what I'll share with you today across a cultural, generational and geographic design divide from one side of the South Pacific Ocean all the way to the other side. Also across time zones, having got up early on Tuesday morning to speak to you on Monday afternoon. There are innumerable di divides between Aotearoa New Zealand and Chile, and different indigenous heritages, the country of origin of the people who colonized our lands, the language that we speak, the basis of our economies, the climate and vegetation. The cars we drive and the streetlights look kind of similar, but the houses we live in and the lives we lead are very different. Yet I believe that there's value in speaking across such divides, a possibility of learning from and about each other. On that basis, I'll share some thoughts drawn from occupational science research for you to consider from your vantage point as occupational therapists and occupational therapy students in Chile. My aim in speaking to you today is to demonstrate how research can inform practice through promoting understanding of human occupation and as a guide to thinking and action. Um, and the photo that I have on this slide is a, a cheeky one. So that was me in Chile uh, and I met this group of construction workers, I believe, just as they were having a tea break. So uh, joined them for a photograph. Uh, I think they thought that it was funny as well. To inform our conversation today, I'll start with some big ideas. The first is social inclusion, which is important because it reminds us who our work is for, the groups that are systematically excluded from society. Inclusion, I believe, is the ultimate goal of occupational therapy and the reason that societies need occupational therapists just realized there's a little bit of sun right in the middle of my face, so I'm gonna shuffle sideways a little bit. And I guess in, in New Zealand at least, and in my experience of practicing as an occupational therapist, the cultural divide and the exclusion that um, really operated and that I was part of shifting was the exclusion of people with disabilities. But I believe that our remit these days is much wider. So I'll invite you to think about social inclusion from an occupational perspective and to look at some of the evidence that occupational scientists have generated about immigrants and inclusion and immigrants and exclusion. And focusing on immigrants, I'm not in any way meaning to diminish or deny the injustices experienced by other groups. However, they are a group about, about whom we're relatively well informed so they'll, they'll be the focus for today and, and a lot of the evidence that I'm drawing on. From there, I'll explore how the knowledge can inform our work as therapists um, and with communities and society. After a brief summary, I'll open the session up for questions. The concept at the center of my presentation is social inclusion. And I have just realized that if I push that button there, there we go, you won't need to watch all of the bits down the side. The concept at the center of my presentation is social inclusion. There are two reasons for that choice. First, the United Nations is promoting the idea of society for all, with the goal of creating more stable, safe and just societies lessening the risks of social tension and conflict. So they're really 
um, giving us a vision that will obviously is aspirational, that will be very hard to achieve, but a vision nonetheless that occupational therapists and occupational scientists can contribute to. So a vision of societies that are stable, safe and just, and that through doing that, that we will lessen the, the risk of social tension and the risk of conflict within society. In inclusive societies, every person has rights and responsibilities. Importantly, people also have a sense of belonging, participation, inclusion, recognition and legitimacy. So let me just read that list again because again it's very aspirational um, and points us to the importance of the work that we do. A sense of belonging, participation, inclusion, recognition and legitimacy. If we look at that list less formally, that means that people will feel appreciated and valued in their community. They'll feel that they belong there and that they're culturally and socially accepted and that they're welcome. They have opportunities and can access employment, housing, education, healthcare and social services. Thus, regardless of background, each person can achieve their potential. Inclusive societies embrace diversity, valuing and harnessing the potential that comes from having a range of diverse ideas, opinions, skills, and practices to draw on. Achieving that requires members of society, employers, teachers, politicians, bureaucrats, colleagues, neighbors, and friends, all of us, to practice inclusiveness by letting people in and making them feel welcome. We're all part of creating a society where everyone feels safe to express their opinions, feels that their point of view will be heard and their contribution valued. Importantly, social inclusion also means enabling people to participate in making decisions that affect their lives. The benefits we all enjoy as a consequence are greater social cohesion, and lower levels of mental illness and loneliness. And that relates to the stress um, that exists for all of us when there are people who are held on the outside of, of our societies, people that come to be perceived as, as dangerous or a threat to the rest of us. The second reason to center my presentation on social inclusion is because of the prominence given to inclusion by the World Federation of Occupational Therapists, and particularly within their document, the Minimum Standards for Education of Occupational Therapists, revised in 2016. Uh, so the standards are really an outline of what schools should be doing, the resources that they should be gathering, um, and the kinds of skills and knowledge that the teachers should have. In particular, the skills specify that occupational therapists will contribute to building a more peaceful, prosperous and just world. We are to do that by addressing occupational therapists' responsibility to uphold the principles of dignity, equality and equity in all matters relating to social inclusion, health and well-being and inclusion. The standards also specify that one educational goal is to teach students to promote change towards a more inclusive and participatory society. So really setting that up as the goal that occupational therapy is to achieve, what we're to contribute to our societies. Thus occupational therapists are given a mandate to work actively for social inclusion with the diverse populations that we serve. Why is working for inclusion given such prominence? Partly because being excluded is so harmful to the individuals themselves and to societies as a whole. The kinds of divides I'm referring to can generally be traced back to discrimination against people with identified differences, be that their disability, and as I mentioned, that's the kind of exclusion that occupational therapists have mostly 
um, worked against, at least within the English-speaking world. Exclusion because of race, which encompasses discrimination against Indigenous populations. Discrimination on the basis of age, um, and thus the ways that societies around the globe discount the perspectives of children and older adults. Gender discrimination, or more specifically, discrimination against females. Discrimination because of people's sexual orientation, because they're poor or a foreign immigrant, and other factors, um, or indeed any combination of those factors. As I mentioned, I'll talk about being an immigrant as an exemplar of experiencing a social divide and being discriminated against, as this is an area where occupational scientists um, from both New Zealand and South America have made a really important contribution. Let us for a moment turn to the theoretical understandings of successful immigration. So at least in the English speaking world that I'm part of, Berry's 1997 theory of acculturation has really dominated our thinking. He proposed four possible outcomes for immigrants, assimilation, integration, separation or marginalization. Of those outcomes, integration is associated with the best psychosocial health outcomes and is achieved when immigrants embrace both cultures. That is, they continue to value their culture of origin and strive to maintain it, while also pursuing regular contact with the dominant culture. For the British women pictured in, on this slide, who were sponsored immigration to New, immigrants to New Zealand after World War II, integration wasn't too challenging they were not so different from the local population. So at that time, New Zealand was very much a British colony. We um, very deeply identified with Britain. Um, many New Zealand men and women were fresh back from fighting in World War II. Britain was certainly very high on the agenda. Um, one of the reasons I chose this image to illustrate the slides is that my mother was amongst this group of immigrants to New Zealand. So she's not in the photograph, but uh, she was what we mm, somewhat rudely refer to as a 10 pound pom, someone who came to New Zealand with their fare um, heavily sponsored by the New Zealand government. Successfully integrating into a host society is, is a useful insight as far as it goes. But how do new immigrants move from being, being observers to participants in the new culture that they encounter? How do they preserve cultural practices that they know and value while taking on the style of eating, dressing, working, talking, learning, and other occupations of the host society? Taking an occupational rather than Berry's psychological viewpoint means taking note of both the things that people do and the context and how that context shapes their occupational possibilities. For example, what happens when local people expect immigrants to shed their culture of origin, to blend in and take on local values, outlooks and practices? What do immigrants do if the efforts to integrate are not welcomed and supported, if the reception is hostile? Already we can see that bringing an occupational perspective to the social phenomenon of, an, of immigration will uncover new perspectives to inform both immigrants and members of the host society. So it's time to turn to the evidence. Let's start with Chauvinaya's study of what immigrant um, women from India to New Zealand do to make a place for themselves in this country. Her grounded theory study generated insights into women's constant shifts between doing things in the Indian way or doing things the Kiwi way. They make judgments about what to do and how to do it based on their interpretation of the context along with their interactions with people, processes, the resources that they have, and so on. 
through their occupations, they learn to reveal as much or as little of their Indian heritage as they're comfortable with in the moment. Over a longer time frame, Lizette's study with members of a Chilean family who emigrated to Sweden 24 years previously showed up differences in Swedish and Chilean ways of doing things and how some encounters with others' culture continue to be puzzling and hurtful. So these were uh, um, accounts that people gave of their early days in Sweden. Um, and the hurt was still very evident, their puzzlement about the treatment that they had received and the ways that the Swedish people had not welcomed them in, um, but continued to do what they ordinarily did. Lizette observed that the divergence of the parents and their now adult children, um, so the parents' Latin American heritage and the children's Swedish lifestyles, were causing dramatic changes in family life, but that the family tradition of having Sunday lunch together provided possibilities to renegotiate their identity as a family, their cultural values and their relationship with each other and with their culture of origin. In contrast, for the South Korean immigrants that Hagi and Kim interviewed, and these were immigrants to New Zealand, the anticipated benefits of moving here were difficult to achieve due to language barriers, to their limited social networks, and to the prejudiced social reception. Um, and somewhat surprisingly to me, they hadn't really anticipated that not being fluent English speakers would be a barrier. Um, and also that they had expected um, by and large that they would be welcomed. Um, so from their memories of New Zealand soldiers coming to help them in the Korean War, they expected that the same warmth and generosity would be available to them on a day-to-day -day basis in New Zealand. And what they found was that that was not the case, that they were perceived and treated as any other Asian immigrant, and that meant not always warmly. In response to those barriers, they sought out the Korean enclave, a culturally familiar environment in which they could use their existing skills and knowledge to engage in occupations. Being in that enclave and finding a place where they could um, behave as themselves do familiar things, really provided them with a pathway from which to then go on to learn about their new environment. Being amongst other Koreans in New Zealand readied them for participation in occupations more reflective of New Zealand society. In addition to, master, um, in addition to mastery of their new surroundings, they hoped to find a place in New Zealand where they could feel accepted and valued. However, the discrimination they encountered constrained their occupational choices and the meanings they could derive from participation, um, which reveals that occupation is inseparable from the context in which it occurs. While those studies were stimulated by the researchers' personal backgrounds as immigrants, the research that Valerie Wright Sinclair and Chauvinaya undertook together responded to social debate over New Zealand's family reunification policies, which allow immigrants to bring their aging parents to the country. There's some um, parameters and rules around that, of course. One prominent view in New Zealand society is that these older adults will be a burden to the social welfare system and that they'll use up expensive medical services that they have not been part of um, funding and providing. In contrast, the study revealed that older um, Indian, Korean and Chinese immigrants work to strengthen community. First, connecting with and giving advice to each other so that they can thrive in this new place. And then fulfilling their duties to society by using old skills and new skills that they acquired um, after they arrived to contribute to community health. At the same time, 
they kept busy and active um, to preserve their own health. So they strove to maintain physical and emotional well-being. So what have we learned so far? We've learned that immigrants want to preserve their own ways of doing things and in addition, seek to become part of the host community. Interacting with co-nationals provides them a familiar place to start where they can use existing skills and learn new skills to make a contribution and to sustain health. Then through engaging with local people, they want to become valued members of society and to feel a sense of belonging. It's also apparent that the process of adjustment to a new occupational context is ongoing over the lifespan. However, some immigrants face barriers to belonging and making a contribution that seem insurmountable. Charles Mofu's study with immigrant and refugee health professionals um, who came from non-English speaking backgrounds revealed how their qualifications were denigrated in New Zealand, which means that they cannot register to practice as doctors, dentists, and physiotherapists in this country. Many of them move into unskilled work while they try to pass expensive English language proficiency tests and study to reset medical examinations. With little support and guidance, they can be left financially insecure, depressed and lost. Rather than being a valued resource, which is what they envisaged and hoped when they immigrated to this country, they find that their skills and work ethic are underutilized. As one said, it's hard to be pushed away. Latin American women immigrants to Spain are similarly at risk of lives dominated by occupational struggles due to, in part to the very high number of immigrants in Spain um, and to the socioeconomic crisis of the early 2000s. A prominent risk factor for these women is the stereotyping of Latin American men as drunks and women as sexually available. Rather than the professional roles that they qualified for, these women find themselves being offered only domestic work where they're vulnerable to being exploited by employers and subjected to unwanted sexual advances. Trapped into strenuous and difficult work and living conditions, they experience frustration, anger and helplessness, feeling that they've no option but to endure and endure. And I guess the next um, account that I want to give you indicates that sometimes those situations are not easily solved and that the situations also endure. So in Canada, Began and Etowa talked with women of African descent living in Nova Scotia. African people have been in Nova Scotia since the 1600s when they were forcibly imported as slaves. Despite that long history, the women experience daily racism, but counter its negative effects through spiritual occupations, prayer, Bible studies, singing spiritual songs, and other activities related to the church. Their faith helps them to reinterpret the suffering caused by racism as challenges accompanied by God's blessings. The hope that provides helps them to survive the ongoing abuse. What these researchers reveal is that around the world, people find themselves in circumstances where they experience discrimination and social exclusion. Um, and the image that I've chosen for this slide, in fact, was in Chile, um, but I believe demonstrated a level of discrimination operating in Chile at the time that I took the photograph. So this was um, clearly a mum and her young son, I'm guessing, um, a boy with cerebral palsy. They're outside their home, which was a single room in an abandoned railway station. Immigrants' rights and their children's rights are not upheld and they experience real suffering. 
um, from an occupational perspective, we can see that being excluded means not having equitable opportunities to do, be, belong and become. Occupational injustice, like social injustice, causes avoidable harm to people's health and development. It wastes their potential and shortens their lifespan. Earlier, I argued that occupational therapists can play a role in creating inclusive environments, inclusive societies, and that we have a professional responsibility to do so. I've also presented evidence about the ways immigrants work to become a part of society, the occupational injustices that many of them experience and the harms that are perpetuated. As a profession, we can respond to that knowledge in two ways by asserting that inclusion of immigrants is an issue of occupational rights and by asserting immigrants' moral claim for inclusion in society. Let's take a moment to clarify what those terms mean. So when I use the term occupational rights, I'm defining that as recognition of people's inherent dignity and their inalienable right to um, freedom the inalienable freedom of all members of the human family to participate equally and derive benefits from their chosen occupations, along with the freedom from being coerced and forced to engage in occupations that undermine life, liberty, and personal security. Um, so notice that that's a positive freedom, a freedom to do things, and also a negative freedom, a freedom from the things that we know that harm people from being forced to do things that undermine their life, liberty and security. And the term moral, the moral claim for inclusion. So when I assert that people have a moral claim for inclusion, what we're arguing is that they're worthy of social and occupational justice. Uh, and when I looked across um, a bunch of occupational science literature, what I observed was that occupational scientists make claims, make that claim that people are worthy of inclusion by demonstrating that they're willing and insightful about their situation, that they're making a tremendous effort on their own behalf. They show how discrimination channels people into unskilled, vulnerable work situations, into making poor choices about what to do. Occupational scientists present evidence that despite their best efforts, people are suffering and struggling, that there's a gap between what they're capable of, what they could contribute to society and their opportunities to do so. So what are we to do? Um, and the figurines on this picture um, were in a shop um, at the end of the train line, if I remember exactly, uh, in um, the capital of Chile, in Santiago. Those of us working in health settings need to recognise that practising the occupations of one's culture of origin is a legitimate health-supporting choice and one that helps immigrants gain confidence to engage in their new cultural context. That knowledge legitimizes us incorporating their practices into therapy, suggests that helping people link with co-nationals is a health supporting thing to do, and underlines the importance of being culturally responsive. It also reminds us to be alert to unconscious bias and discrimination within the health services where we work. Um, so that kind of sounds simple, but is immensely difficult to do. In our work promoting occupational justice with immigrant communities, confirming the value of continuing to practice their own culture is important for both the immigrants themselves and as an intervention to counter discriminatory attitudes of members of the receiving cult community. So that I know that within New Zealand, for example, there is a sector of people who just want immigrants to start acting like Kiwis, who really question and denigrate 
practices that come from their own cultures who see no value in them continuing to do the things that are familiar, the things that enforce for their children and for future generations, where they're from, and to be proud of who they are and where they're from. As occupational therapists who know the value of occupation, we can be part of the voice that speaks against that perspective. Along with championing occupational justice and asserting immigrants' moral claim for inclusion, the concept of occupational consciousness developed by Ramagundo in 2015 has utility. Occupational consciousness prompts recognition of the ways that dominant and discriminatory practices are sustained through the things that people do every day, thus perpetuating the power dynamics laid down during colonialism. Dominant practices can work against immigrants in the same way that they work against peoples who were colonized. Being conscious of that is liberating, framing everyday doing as a response to oppressive social structures. Being occupationally conscious prompts people to think about what they're doing and the kind of world they're creating by doing things in such a way. Occupational science also supports the development of theory, including frameworks to guide action. Uh, and the framework that I have on the slide here is the participatory occupational justice framework, um, which started as a collaboration between um, Professor Emeritus Liz Townsend at Dalhousie University in Canada and Gail Whiteford in Australia. So if we just look at the slide for a moment, um, in the center, collaborative enabling processes. And then around that, six actions that they um, recognized as being really important. Um, not hierarchical, not done in any particular order, all of things, these things having various um, importance depending on the context. So um, starting with the blue color, um, actions to raise consciousness of occupational injustice. Actions to engage collaboratively with partners. Actions that mediate um, agreement on plans of what to do of a way forward. Definitely actions to strategize how they will get the funding that they need for the resources. Um, actions that implement um, change and continuous evaluation of what people are doing. Um, and actions that inspire advocacy for sustainability. The goal of the Occupational Performance Justice Pro um, Framework is to promote social inclusion by outlining a pathway for collaborative action against occupational injustice. Its strength is in prompting us to attend to the ever-present power relations in, in the complex, multi-layered environments in which occupational injustices play out for immigrants and other people subjected to discrimination. Through actions informed by the participatory occupational justice framework, we can work at a societal level to support social inclusion for all, a process already underway amongst social occupational therapists in Brazil, um, and I'm um, here, I'm not sure of the situation in Chile. In conclusion, my aim in this presentation was to demonstrate how research can inform practice through promoting understanding of human occupation um, and as a guide to action. Drawing on occupational science research with immigrants, I shared perspectives on how practicing occupations of their culture of origin and the host society creates meaning, identity, well being, and flourishing for immigrants and the members of the host society alike. I also reported how di discriminatory stereotypes can diminish immigrants' prospects, creating a gulf between them and the receiving society that causes harm on both sides. Driven by the United Nations imperative to build inclusive societies, and the World Federations of Occupational Therapists Educational Standards, I argued that occupational therapists have a responsibility to enter this space. 
we have a unique and valuable contribution to make, revealing occupation as the means by which people in vulnerable circumstances endeavour to look after themselves and to contribute to society. Finally, I interpreted how occupational therapists working in traditional roles in the health system, as, the, as well as those working with communities, can take up this knowledge to be champions for social inclusion, creating inclusive societies through our own everyday practices. Thank you for listening. Um, and at this point, of course, I have some um, references, but at this point, just throw the um, panel open to questions and to comments. Let me um, stop sharing the screen so that we can see each other more clearly. Okay, so questions and for those of you um, who have been following in Spanish, then the interpreters are here and ready to help us to communicating with, with each other. Bueno, tal como Claire nos eh, invita, eh, extendemos la invitación a todos y a todas a aprovechar este espacio en que podamos dialogar. Pueden hacer sus preguntas eh, usando el micrófono, para eso les vamos a pedir que idealmente prendan la cámara, o, o al menos el micrófono, o bien lo pueden, eh, pueden dejar su pregunta escrita en el chat, y yo leo la pregunta. Randy. Sí, no, no puedo levantar la mano porque soy anfitrión. Bueno, muchas gracias, Claire, por la, por la presentación. Eh, y me, me quedó varias, varias cosas dando vuelta. ¿eh? La primera, eh, la verdad es que cuando, quizás es una visión un poco romántica, ¿no? pero cuando yo miro la, la sociedad neozelandesa, eh, lo que veo es que eh, en, en términos inclusivos, eh, principalmente con los pueblos originarios, eh, hay, un, hay un, un, mm. un avance bien importante, ¿no? eh, al menos lo que se ve de afuera. Eh, eso se ve en el ejemplo cuando veo la, la selección de rugby de Nueva Zelanda, los All Blacks, ¿cierto? Y, sí. y hay una identificación con el pueblo maorí muy fuerte. Eh, el negro, la, la hoja del uniforme, eh, el jaca. Entonces, a pesar de que los jugadores son caucásicos, no son necesariamente maorí. Y eso me hace pensar de que en, al, en algún sentido la, la inclusión tiene que ver con la identificación de otro diferente. Eh, ¿Cómo logras como sociedad que sea propio tuyo algo que puede ser distinto y lo tomas como propio y te identificas y estás orgulloso ¿no? de lo que puede ser diferente? Eh, a tu juicio... Eh, ¿Cómo o crees que esa identificación eh, existe realmente en, el, en, en Nueva Zelanda o es una estrategia de marketing o publicitaria del, del rugby? Eh, o, eh, y, ¿Y cómo, como terapeutas ocupacionales, podemos eh, eh, generar o propiciar, eh, tender a esa identificación de toda una sociedad con aquellos que son distintos? Uh, thank you. That's a um, deliberately challenging question. Um, of course, some members of New Zealand society do not like the shift that's happening. Um, actually, let me start further back. The shift that is happening is through the efforts of Maori people themselves. Um, it didn't magically happen that the rest of society suddenly welcomed them and embraced their culture. Uh, but Maori people have reminded us that we have a legal obligation to them under the treaty that was originally signed. 
Um, and, and it is not universally welcomed, but increasingly welcomed and increasingly visible. Um, I saw an item on the news just last night where um, a small town uh, where the name of the town has been mispronounced for decades, um, and now there is a move that it get its right name and that the name is pronounced the proper way because the way that it's kind of pronounced currently is meaningless. Um, it's meaningless to everybody. Um, I think that you're absolutely right that, that there is a shift and hopefully an accelerating shift, that Maori language is becoming much more prevalent, um, that many more people are welcoming Maori culture into our lives, that we understand that we can, uh, and I'm speaking here as a Pākehā, that Pākehā can only be Pākehā in this space, that my identity is of this space, that it is not, um, I can't be Pākehā because I'm British, um, that I can be Pākehā because I'm here and that this country um, has many cultures, but its first relationship is with Māori. How can occupational therapists assist with that? I think there are many things that we're doing. The first is challenging ourselves. So at a political level within the association, we now have a dual governance structure so that within the association, which is um, the body that represents us to the rest of society, we now have um, two presidents um, and, and equal numbers of Māori and Pākehā um, where each group can um, address issues, think for themselves about what those things mean to them and then come back together to find the common ground. So, and again, um, it's, it's the Māori occupational therapists who led the way, supported by some Pākehā allies um, and increasing number of us who identify as allies. Um, but yeah, within the association itself, making a standpoint that we are a bicultural profession in a bicultural place and that we should therefore behave that way. Um, the other thing that we um, really are doing is sharing resource to the extent that um, when we have the luxury of using occupations um, as our therapy, then um, we are nudged and pushed and um, again, Māori people support and resource us to use Māori cultural um, and traditional occupations as the means of therapy. So um, I know, for example, that in the local forensic mental health unit, um, kapahaka, exactly what you see at the beginning of the rugby games, um, is being revived as a means for helping um, that very vulnerable population to reconnect with their culture, to feel proud, to feel dignified, to have a place um, and to have a place to positively assert themselves. Yeah. So through the, the things that we do, the language that we are learning, the questioning uh, of the resources that are available to us from the rest of the English speaking world, um, the formal assessments that contain no Maori language um, and therefore advantage Pākehā people. So we're learning to question all of those things. We're learning what it means to practice in a place that is not Britain. Muchas gracias, Randy. Eh, vamos a dar la palabra ahora a Daniela Olivares. Hi, Claire. Thank Hi. you for staying with us today. 
Um, but I'll um, um, question in Spanish. Um, yeah. Claire, um, estaba pensando en eh, una eh, eh, histórica contradicción entre eh, el modelo eh, médico o biomédico con el cual fuimos formados ya hace bastante tiempo en la Universidad de Chile, en Santiago de Chile, sobre sí. separar el yo, o el cogito, diría Descartes, de nuestra propia vida y la vida de nuestros eh, usuarios, clientes. Sin embargo, eh, hoy día en nuestra ciencia y tu misma presentación, hablas en primera persona, lo cual me parece maravilloso, porque resignificas tu propia historia, que es mucho de lo que hacemos muchos eh, durante nuestra vida, sobre todo quienes ya tenemos algunos años más que nuestros estudiantes. Sin embargo, a propósito de los, eh, de, del estándar, de las normas, para eh, acreditarse como una eh, escuela de terapia ocupacional con las normas de la Federación Mundial. Me estaba acordando de los de, de, de los estándar para, para eh, pertenecer a ese selecto grupo. Eh, estaba pensando cómo, eh, en tu opinión, enseñamos a nos a nuestros estudiantes, sobre eso. Vincular la propia historia con nuestra práctica, pero tomando cierta distancia, o cierta distancia epistémica, y no circunscribir solamente nuestra propia experiencia limitada, como toda experiencia humana, en nuestras acciones. Sino que ser capaces de, a propósito, de nuestra propia historia, poder ver más allá y eh, hacer una práctica eh, culturalmente respetuosa, culturalmente centrada, eh, y ese es el desafío eh, que eh, por las eh, asignaturas que yo realizo eh, es mi permanente desafío, cómo partir de, 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 de mi propia historia, pero trans, traspasarla eh, a un aprendizaje mayor. ¿Cómo lo ves tú en la práctica de la educación, en la formación de nuestros futuros colegas? Yeah, thank you for that um, question, Daniela. Um, it, it's, you know, what you're talking about is one of the very big challenges as educators, isn't it, is that particularly when we're talking about occupation, then the occupations that we are most familiar with, the ones that are most available to us as teachers, are the ones from the cultures in which we are embedded. Um, and, and how do we really bring other perspectives into the classroom and how do we um, really instill in our students not just a sense that other people's occupations are different because you know at a rational level they know that um, but how do we skill them to ask other people about what they do and how they do it and how it works out um, in very respectful terms and how do we move them to a position of really valuing um, those differences and, and it's not as simple as um, noticing that our students within the classrooms in New Zealand, the students themselves are becoming much more diverse, but it's never as simple as saying, well, you're Chinese, 
you show us what you do because it's we cannot um, assume that our students are ready to expose themselves to their peers in, in that way. Um, I think that one of the strategies that I used was to learn to stop making grand statements. So I learned to never say, in New Zealand, this is true, because that's only true for the New Zealand that I experience. And in subtle ways and over time, I learned that that's not the New Zealand that many other people experience. Um, I learned to say, when I do something, but, you know, in no way am I presuming that this is something that you will want to do or that you will do in the same way. Um, I think that also, you know, as a profession, one of my observations of occupational therapy um, is that we, and, and maybe you are not prone to this in Chile, but the, the, my observation of occupational therapy is that we expect to be experts in everything. And we're very slow at drawing in the person who really is expert. Um, and so for teaching occupational therapy students about difference, I can change what I do, but I think even more powerfully, bring some other people into that space to teach with us, um, which is also has its challenges. Universities aren't um, fonts of money. They don't make it easy for us to bring in um, people who do other things and who do things in different ways. Um, but, you know, our students exist in societies where there are different people and they have people that they can access. So sometimes um, broadening out our teaching is about demanding of our students that they find the resources that they need to learn, that they expose themselves to occupations that are unfamiliar and uncomfortable and challenging with people in society that they have not previously had any contact with, whether that's across an age divide or um, a cultural divide or a gender divide or whatever else it is. I think we need to bring in our students and to trust them more um, that they know what they're familiar with and what they're not familiar with and where the learning um, point will be for them. Gracias. Muchas gracias, Daniela, por tu pregunta. Ahora voy a leer una pregunta eh, en el que me llegó por interno. Voy a buscar... Acá. Eh, es de un estudiante nuestro eh, de quinto año, eh, la pregunta es de Franco, Franco Aguilar, eh, agradece la presentación eh, y hace la siguiente pregunta, ¿qué piensa usted sobre la inclusión social y la pandemia? Eh, la pandemia finalmente ha creado una nueva vida cotidiana, ¿cómo podemos o podríamos hacer inclusión social y justicia ocupacional en este contexto? ¿Cómo pensamos o creamos eh, nuevas estrategias de inclusión para una situación tan inédita como esta? Una pregunta muy relevante actualmente. You're expecting me to be wiser than I am. Um, 
One one of the things that has become apparent in New Zealand um, through the pandemic, um, and which we we knew already, but is underlined by the current situation, is that government has not learned to speak to the different groups within our society. Um, And New Zealand is in a very privileged position where we have largely contained the virus. Um, But the, the threat of an outbreak is always there. And what we've seen is that the small outbreaks that have occurred have largely been um, within minority populations. Um, and, sh- and what that has revealed is that within those populations, people didn't know. They didn't know what to do, or they had misunderstood what to do. Um, and, and so, you know, clearly those are still issues of inclusion, even though they are populations that either are the indigenous population or populations that have been here for a very long time. Um, So I guess that one of the ways that occupational therapists could step up in a pandemic is to think about, um, you know, the pandemic as something that requires all of us to do things differently Um, and that that in order to do things differently people need to very quickly and very accurately know what that is Um, and maybe the role that occupational therapy can really play is not to um, volunteer to be the people who learn how to give people the COVID inoculation vaccine, but to be the people who work with marginalised populations to help them to understand what they need to do and to solve the problems that they have of how to live differently. Vale. Eh, Muchas gracias, Franco, por tu pregunta. Eh, Ahora le vamos a dar la palabra a Rodolfo. Hola, Rodolfo. Si puedes encender tu cámara. Gracias. Hola, muchísimas gracias. ¿Se escucha bien? Sí. Bien. eh, Primero que todo, agradecer a Claire. Muchísimas gracias por la presentación. Una presentación muy inspiradora y muy rica en cuanto a, a, a contenido sobre las perspectivas ¿no? de, de migración y la inclusión social. Así que muchas gracias como primera cosa. Eh, mi pregunta tiene que ver más con conocer eh, tu opinión respecto a cómo las perspectivas más críticas en ciencia de la ocupación, ciencia ocupacional, eh, están pensando el tema de la inclusión, ¿no? Estoy pensando en estas perspectivas que ponen en, en tela de juicio, por ejemplo, el propio concepto de inclusión social o de justicia ocupacional, ¿no? Creo que ahí hay, una, hay como una primera cuestión que, que me interesaría eh, que tú nos pudieses eh, transmitir, ¿no? Desde tu, aquí como tu rol en, en la revista, principalmente de, de ciencia de la ocupación, en donde tienes, me imagino, una perspectiva muy amplia respecto a las distintas teorías, enfoques, incluso por regiones, ¿no? De, del mundo, que me parecería interesante. Y una segunda cuestión que quería preguntarte tiene que ver, eh, siguiendo con la pregunta que hacía Daniela sobre el currículum, sobre la formación, ¿cómo se puede pensar también de forma más crítica la inclusión social cuando muchas veces nuestros currículum están construidos en base a una serie de prejuicios o de preconceptos vinculados a ciertas formas de comprender a nuestros propios sujetos ¿no? de intervención? ¿sí? Estoy pensando en, en cómo 
han existido actualmente varias investigaciones que critican el tema del racismo ¿no? y la blanquitud, el whiteness ¿no? del currículum en la formación, en donde se construye una, una historia de la disciplina incluso ¿no? de una perspectiva particular, se construye un sujeto eh, imaginado desde una forma específica, ¿no? y creo que ahí hay elementos que probablemente aparecen desde la xenofobia, desde el racismo, que están implícitos en el currículum. Entonces quería saber si esta era una cuestión eh, que, que pudiese reflexionarse en la propia formación y cómo la investigación también nos hace un aporte ¿no? para pensar nuestro propio currículum y nuestra propia formación como terapeutas y como cientistas de la ocupación. Muchas gracias. Thank you, Rodolfo. Um, again, a challenging question. Um, you know, my experience of becoming a more inclusive society started with Maori people asserting their own position, um, but also of people like me becoming allies to that. And I think that both of those actions are necessary. I think that the people who are discriminated against and marginalised within societies certainly need to speak up. Um, but they need to be... That will work better if members of the mainstream society team with them and help to assert those viewpoints. Um, from a perspective in New Zealand, I think that we are reaching a place where mainstream society is more open to hearing that the ways that we understand things and the ways that things are done just don't work for everybody. Um, and that some of the, the things that are automatically held very close by, um, by people of British descent directly contravene um, the, the wisdom that other cultures have um, and that they contravene very deeply held spiritual beliefs. Um, And it, it's only when those contraventions are pointed out that they can even be recognized. So how do we change the curriculum? We change it by um, the people who are harmed speaking back to, to us, me, um, to say, uh, that's not right. The viewpoint that you are projecting is not right because you know from where I'm standing I can recognize that mostly almost totally occupational therapy has been described in terms that are entirely consistent with my worldview with the worldview that I was born into and that entirely suit me a middle-class, middle-aged white woman. Um, and I can see historical examples of where that led to actions that were simply ridiculous and harmful. Seeing them in the present day is much more challenging. But I think that... Um, that By, by being very active and seeking to know that, that shifts can be made. Um, so certainly there are Pākehā people who are um, talking to our own privilege and talking to the ways that that harms other people. Um, but 
you know, if we do that in a vacuum of not very actively seeking the other perspectives that exist, then the progress will never be fast enough. Um, one, one, of the, one of my own critiques of occupational therapy um, education in New Zealand is that our relationships, and, and with the school that I'm associated with, which is the one I can um, speak to and most openly criticise, um, we don't have strong enough relationships even with people with disabilities, our traditional group, let alone with other groups who are struggling against occupational injustices in New Zealand. Um, and that really things shift when there are relationships. And for me, that's, that's the real pathway and that we need to be very active in seeking that. In New Zealand, it's very clear what the priority should be. The priority for us is to much more deeply engage with Māori um, because that's the first relationship. And the things that we change in our engaging with Māori actually will serve all of us better because they deeply open up a uh, knowing at, at a spiritual level that um, the inherited British ways is not the only way and is not even the best way for the British descendants. Um, but, it, you know, I continue to stumble across incidents of that, um, that for Maori New Zealanders are blatant and are injurious and are their lived everyday reality. Um, and I live in a world that is privileged and protects me against that. Um, so some of the answer is that the people in privileged positions need to put ourselves in situations where we will be much less comfortable um, and to get over the fact that, that it will be uncomfortable. I, I don't know if you know the concept of white fragility, but it's, uh, um, are, are you familiar with that concept? Um, white fragility. Um, which, which is ver viewed very cynically is a way that we protect ourselves against really having to change because as soon as something gets too challenging, we, we can suddenly act like we're the people who are being hurt. Um, and a very female way to respond to that is to cry, which then makes the people who are challenging us feel guilty and move into a position of comforting us and, um, and reducing the level of challenge. So it's a very powerful way of, of protecting ourselves and protecting that things stay the same. Um, and it's a way that I have very little, um, I don't want to accommodate it. I, um, my perspective is that Maori people in New Zealand have been injured for almost two centuries, they have been injured from the moment that white people arrived. Why would um, changing our society to be less colonial, why would that be comfortable? Why wouldn't it cause me any discomfort 
uh, why wouldn't it be challenging? Um, and that's that is simply from my perspective to acknowledge that Maori people are challenged and discomforted every day. Uh, so, yeah, why would it be comfortable for me? I've forgotten what your question was, <laughs> but hopefully that goes a, a little way towards um, towards answering it. I think that true inclusion can be exciting and enriching um, and that to get there is not always going to be comfortable, that it will be challenging and um, that it will, it will shift some of the things, not even that we hold dear, but just views of, of how things are, assumptions that are made about what to do, how to do it, what's right, what's the view. Um, you know, in, in, in my own everyday practice, one of those views is the one that um, Daniela already pointed to, that there's a presumption that, you know, the teacher will be the teacher, that we will always know, that we will be the expert, and that we don't and shouldn't um, reveal very much of ourselves in that process. Um, and I simply don't know anymore how that can possibly work. Eh, muchas gracias, Rodolfo. Eh, preguntar, Claire, si tenemos tiempo para dos preguntas más. Preguntarte a ti. Yep. Sí. Vale. Ya, yeah. eh, voy a hacer una pregunta yo que se vincula con el tema que estábamos, eh, que pregunta Rodolfo y Daniela también introdujo. Y yo, eh, bueno, trabajo en el contexto escolar los temas de inclusión, en el caso chileno. Eh, y, y claro, adscribo a perspectivas críticas eh, sobre el concepto de inclusión que mayoritariamente fue eh, propuesto desde una mirada como más bien neutral o despolitizada, que es la principal crítica que se le hace al concepto de inclusión de corriente principal. Creo que también un problema con respecto que nos diferencia en esto de, de pensar en las brechas eh, de la distancia también que nos diferencia en los territorios es que en el caso de América Latina y particularmente en el caso chileno tenemos, no podemos obviar, ignorar que tenemos un estado eh, bien reducido con derechos básicos no cubiertos en Chile se terceriza la educación principalmente eh, en todos los niveles eh, en Chile se terceriza la salud eh, eh, y por lo tanto el Estado es más bien un ente que regula y que entrega financiamiento a otras <coughs> entidades para poder eh, ejercer eh, o dar prestaciones de los servicios educativos y, y de salud. Y en el caso de la inclusión, eh, se ha trabajado a través de políticas afirmativas. Estudia por ejemplo, estudiantes en situación de discapacidad tienen acceso a apoyos de terapia ocupacional. No así, la ley es clara, no así estudiantes migrantes que no hablen español, por ejemplo. ¿Vale? Eh, en el caso de salud, el terapeuta ocupacional está eh, contratado para programas específicos y para prestaciones específicas de salud. Por lo tanto, yo creo, para no extenderme más, que uno de los problemas que enfrentamos como, como Chile, ¿no? y pensando en el currículum también, es que el terapeuta ocupacional está adosado a programas donde se delimitan prestaciones específicas. No es desde un marco amplio. 
Por lo tanto, ahí hay un otro desafío, ¿no? ¿Cómo desde los campos en los que hoy día nos desempeñamos los terapeutas, por ejemplo, yo en educación, eh, en la escuela, puedo propiciar otras formas de acción que, eh, número uno, politicen eh, eh, las luchas de inclusión, eh, le entreguen también eh, posibilidad de acción de agencia a las familias, a los estudiantes, a los profesores. Creo que desde ahí se podría, pero me gustaría eh, también conocer tu opinión al respecto, dado que tienes una mirada mucho más amplia que la que puedo tener yo también. I, I don't know that I have a broader viewpoint than you. Um, I, I guess from my own experience, we have to acknowledge that we can't do everything at once. But the resource that we have as educators is the students. And I think that, um, I think education, education is really different than when I was an undergraduate student. When I was a student, um, the whole system behaved as though the teachers were going to tell us what the answer was. And I think now that we are moving to a much more critical place in history where the teachers can never know everything that the students will need to know, which means that really that all that the teachers can do is ask the right questions and to allow the students to come back with a diversity of answers and that they can come back with answers that are true from their own perspective. So answers in New Zealand that we would challenge would be answers that perpetuate racism, but kind of beyond that, then you know, students may have answers that are very different than, that go beyond anything that we know because they come from different life experiences. So, yeah, I, I think that um, once we start understanding occupation in a much more structural way, when we start to understand the things that we do every day create society, that they create, therefore, that they create the future, that, that then we can move to a place where our students can break the reliance on um, ideas that just come from the literature and just come from textbooks and that they can um, find answers that come much more from their own experience but from the experiences that they deliberately seek with communities that are different from their own community. Um, And, and that it's not until we really engage with challenging situations um, in people whose experiences are different from our own that we um, really are beginning to do anything towards inclusion. I, I think that um, Elawali Ramagundo's idea of occupational consciousness and what the doing does at us at a big societal level, what are the systems that we reinforce every day? That's when we can start to break that down. And we have a responsibility to do that within the academies, that we 
cannot accept the way that things are. So a, a very small example, two very small examples from New Zealand. Um, one is that it is now very, um, it's becoming normal practice to start a class with a karakia, which is just a, a formally that means a prayer, but it actually means just a, a moment at the beginning where we make the transition from everything that was happening until we arrive together in the classroom and pause and acknowledge where we are before we move to the content for today. Um, so that's, that's one small um, change. Another is a more structural change within the university. So we're led by our profession, which now has a bicultural um, governance model. And in the university, we're supposed to have an advisory committee. Um, but the advisory committee is set up with the structure that's normal within the university, that there's one chair, there's no necessity of having bicultural representation um, and that the committee is very dominated by um, people from the university and we have recognized that we need to change that structure because until we change the structure the advice that the committee will give us um, will continue to be the same advice which supports us to do things the way they are now and that we won't get critical um, and challenging feedback on what we should be doing differently until we structure that committee very differently. So that's some work that our head of school is currently doing is to um, point out to the university the, the ways that its structures um, inhibit us. Um, and I don't know, we're occupational therapists, so I guess that we will go ahead and create the committee the way that we think that it should be um, and write our own terms of reference and our own rules about who should be on the committee um, and hope that the university catches up with us. Muchas gracias, Claire. Ahora sí, eh, una pregunta más, si alguien quiere hacer eh, la pregunta ahora. Vale. Bueno. Eh, vamos a dejar hasta acá eh, esta conferencia, eh, agradecerte, eh, Claire, por tu eh, enorme generosidad, por habernos eh, aceptado esta invitación, sabemos que tenemos una invitación pendiente, pero que debido a la pandemia eh, tuvimos que postergarla, tenemos invitada a Claire desde hace un año, <risa> pero lamentablemente por la pandemia eh, tuvimos que postergar el viaje, pero aprovechamos también esta plataforma para eh, unir esas distancias tan grandes. <risa> eh, agradecerte también eh, tu, tu valiosa colaboración, la disposición por... Sabemos que allá son aproximadamente las 8 de la mañana recién, 8 y algo. Eh, así que eh, te queremos agradecer también por eso, porque alteramos un poco también la rutina de tu cotidianeidad. <ríe> eh, agradecerles también a todos y a todas las eh, personas que nos han acompañado en esta conferencia. Creemos que es una conferencia de cierre muy valiosa para nosotros eh, dentro de la formación eh, y también agradecerle a los expositores que nos acompañaron durante las ocho charlas que eh, Randy hacía referencia. Eh, 
quiero reiterar que esta exposición va a estar eh, publicada en el canal de YouTube de la Facultad de Medicina en ambos idiomas, en inglés y en español, eh, así que pueden acceder a ella de manera pública y claro, la pueden difundir también. Muchísimas gracias a todos, a todas. No sé si, Randy, te quieres despedir. Solamente, solamente agradecer a Claire, a todos los participantes hoy día, eh, con este gran cierre de, de este ciclo que esperamos volver a repetir eh, pronto. Obviamente, Claire, la invitación sigue en pie para que nos vengas a acompañar cuando eh, la, la pandemia pase, ¿no? y ahí nos podremos conocer en persona. Agradecer a todos los participantes, eh, a nombre de, de la Escuela de Terapia Ocupacional y de la Universidad Austral de Chile, y me despido. Muy buenas tardes a todas. Bye, Claire. Thank you. Bye. Thank you for inviting me. <laughs> Bye, Dani. Chao, Claire. Muchas gracias. Yeah, I see.